Or do you want to drive the slides or should I? Uh, I can drive them assuming I can get them right and I am attempting to do so now. Yep. Can We're you can you can see them? Cool. Yep. <laughs> um, David, maybe we should make a last minute check to make sure these are the latest slides. I think Victor added some late. Um, let's see. Is, is Victor in the room, speaking of? Uh, we might. Uh, anyway, perhaps Victor can check to make sure. And if, if there's anything, uh, we can, I can upload the new ones and do a refresh. So let's see. I mean, if you go to slide 29, I think that's the most recently updated one. Okay. Hold on. Let me try to get there. Yeah, that looks, that looks on the Google drive. I think we're up to date. Okay, cool. Excellent. Oh, right. Julie's joining remotely. Thanks. Has someone seen the physical virtual blue sheet thing? Um, yeah. Uh, pass it around if you can. It, it really helps people remember to sign in. Uh, please definitely sign in. That way we will be in a bigger room next time. Ah, thanks. Uh, Bernard, should we get started? I think our folks have filtered in. Yep. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Web Transport meeting over here in Berlin. That's the name of the meeting room. We're actually in Prague. And yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so, as usual, a reminder this session is being recorded, and some instructions here for how to use the tool. Um, oh, and all the icons are different. We didn't update these, whoops. I mean, these are self-explanatory and if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, all right, next slide. Uh, similarly, the buttons from the tool allow you to join and exit the queue and to mute and unmute, please keep yourself muted and video off unless you're actually actively speaking. Next slide, please. And here are some links. Next slide. And this is the ITF note well. Uh, this is Monday. Probably most of you have already seen it, but maybe not everyone. So by participating in ITF activities, you've agreed to this note well, and hopefully you've read some of it, or at least skimmed it, uh, to highlight a few points. That means that if you contribute, you have to abide by our code of conduct that the chairs will be enforcing and by our, our IPR policies. If you're not aware of the ITF IPR policies, you really should look at them because they have Im impact to, any, to you as a human contributor. Um, all right, and everything else here is also equally important. Uh, next slide. 
Um, yeah, I guess I was mentioning that as well. We really take our code of conduct seriously here and hope that we won't have any concerns. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, all right. Uh, do we have a volunteer to take notes today, please? So as a reminder, we need a note taker to start the meeting. So I'm going to be awkwardly staring around the room until we have one. Is that a volunteering, Eric? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Well, so Eric's going to be doing it for most of the session, except when he's giving a talk. Can someone be backup note taker? This is a small job. Thanks, Lucas. Much appreciated, both of you. Right. And let's use the um, the notes tool. That way, it's you can all look at it at the same time. All right. Thanks. Next slide. All right, this is our agenda. If it looks familiar, it's because it's roughly the same one as our past meetings, uh, where we'll have an update from Will on what's going on at W3C, then updates from our H2 and H3 versions, and then chair wrap up. Would anyone like to bash this agenda? Thank you very much. Then Will, you're up. Bernard, next slide, please. Just, yeah, I think, I think the agenda has been the same for the last year and a half, actually. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we, so, we almost reordered H2 and H3, and then we decided that was too much work. Hey, if it's bash proof, it's bash proof. So, that's <laughs> good. so uh, good afternoon to those in Prague. Uh, my name is Will Law. I co chair the W3C Web Transport Working Group, with, along with Yanni Varbury, who's online as well. We just give you a summary of what's happening on, on the browser side of the protocol. So, we published our last working draft back in July 12th. We gave you an update July 27th, so there hasn't actually been a working draft update since then. It seems like it was just yesterday we were presenting. Our charter still expires the end of this year, but we will get it extended. That's normal W3C operations. We have a timetable. We don't have to go into the details, but we would really like to get our recommendation out the door sometime in 2024. And it should be aligned with the IETF release as well. So. That's at least a request from our side. We uh, aim for at least next year. Uh, we have a, a milestone tracking our the status that for us getting to a candidate release. We're 76% complete there. And we have a number of open PRs. Thanks to Nidhi for picking up some of those. Appreciate that. And anyone else who has an assigned PR and is in the room, um, please uh, get on the list. We had a annual face-to-face -face meeting. Um, I put a link to it there for Tuesday, September 12th. Uh, that was our uh, equivalent of this, this call. And you can read those notes if you wish. Next slide, please. So some major updates and decisions since our last report, July 27th. So firstly, there have been some changes to the stats object. And they're pretty self-explanatory. We removed uh, number outgoing streams and number incoming streams created because the application can figure this out for itself. We added a stat get bytes lost to give us symmetry with packets lost, and we removed timestamp. It's a bit of an attack vector, and performance not now is essentially an equitable replacement for it. The bigger change semantically was the addition of send group. Um, it's basically a number space to preserve fairness between flows when we were, we were using send order, which was a previous creation. So if you have a stream that's up, up incrementing send order with every frame and another one that's inc incrementing it with every GOP, then your frame one's going to get to a higher order and keep having higher priority quicker. So we needed to separate those. So now you can send group equals create send group. You um, get a writable. And you can see that in your constructor, you can assign the send group. And you can also update it uh, afterwards um, as a getter and as a setter. So we think it's a, a nice addition uh, to the spec and allowing for more equitable and fairness between competing flows. Are there questions? Is there a question just coming from Luke? I'm not sure. Uh, go, go ahead, Luke. Yeah, go, Luke. Uh, I can also wait till the end. Um, but when you reprioritize, does it? Uh, what about any data already buffered in the queue? Uh, that's up to the oh, user good. agent implementer. 
I don't think we define it. Victor, would you have an opinion? Because this was uh, Victor's. Um, well, if you buffer it, but it's not written yet, uh, it will go according to the new priority. Uh, if it's already written and on the wire, we can do anything about it. Yeah, different quick libraries do this differently, is why I'm bringing it up. So it's just good to know what um, <laughs> the website will do. OK. Alan? Oh, Alan's in the room. Has, uh, so is there the, the send group priority scheme is different than the HTTP priority scheme, which is totally fine in the way you define it, because it's just an API to your local user agent. But is there an expectation? Will it create strange asymmetries when you have client server web, web transport applications where the client code can use these send groups, but then, or is there an expectation that there will be an extension to HTTP priorities or quick and HTTP libraries will be expected to implement something like send groups? So this is right now it's purely on the send side. These are the send buffers writing it to the wire. Any prioritization over the wire is, is not yet connected to this. Um, would it be ideal if it was perhaps in the future? Um, I think so. Go ahead, Lucas. Hey, Lucas Pardew, uh, this priority is a, enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a uh, API. It's fine. Like, do whatever you like. We've had a lot of discussions in W three C. We should just keep making progress there. To Alan's point, I did write a send order extension for the HP three priorities or whatever. Like, we could do that. Like, no one seemed that bothered, but it seemed to work in my head. I did an implementation of it last hackathon, and it seemed to work too, that implementation. Um, so let's chat offline, maybe. Um, and to Luke's point, yeah, yeah, different libraries do different things. There, there's another extension I have where you might want to store, or it would relate in an ability to store the like the priority at this time, or this byte range was this, and then it changed subsequently through the lifetime of a stream. That's a use case other people have found interesting, but the simple thing is just, yeah, what Victor said, whatever you got buffered can still change because like, that's the easiest thing. It's maybe not exposed to apps because they don't necessarily know how much was flushed versus buffered, but I think at the end of the day, it's good enough to make things work. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So continuing with major decisions and updates. So we now, we ran into the problem of stream ID exhaustion and uh, how should the application be notified it? So now if you try to create a stream and you've exceeded your max stream limit, it will reject immediately and throw a quota exceeded error. There is some debate uh, within the group as to adding an optional constructor, which would let you opt in to being blocked. So. You would rather just wait for the stream to be created than, than have it reject and have to um, reconnect. And there were two valid use cases there. Applications would like to know that it's taking a long time because of the max stream limit versus for some other reason. Um, so we haven't yet added the constructor, but I think there's an issue 446 for that one. Then our second issue is atomic write. So this is when you want to send a transactional piece of data where you don't want half of it arriving. So it's an all or nothing send. This was uh, Yanivar's PR and implementation. Yanivar, did you want to have a chance to speak over this very briefly? Uh, sure, yes. So the first part is uh, the PR. I think discussion has uh, finished. Uh, we're just waiting for uh, getting the check marks on the PR, I hope. But you know, you never know. So it's not merged yet. Uh, so that's the disclaimer. <clears throat> so sending it. So the idea is most web applications probably won't need this, but there are some more transactional applications that have asked for this. So the idea is how to do this in a way that uh, that mixes well with with uh, non-atomic writes. <clears throat> so so we have this uh, concept, a new method on the writer object because this isn't really compatible with pipe two, really. Uh, so the way, if you want to send something transactional, you will, for instance, in this example shows it, create the unidirectional stream, get the writer, 
await the writer to be ready. And instead of writer.write, you say a, a writer.atomic write. <clears throat> and you have a number of bytes that you expect to uh, be sent, all or nothing. <clears throat> and if that rejects uh, it, so normally writes only reject if the whole stream has erred as a terminal situation for that particular stream, not the entire connection. But in here, we get additional semantics that you can also get an abort error uh, if this was blocked on flow control, basically, uh, which is a new state. Uh, the writable remains unerred. The stream remains unerred in this case, uh, unlike re regular lights, writes. So using this mechanism, and there's some details here. Uh, if you normally, uh, we advise people to always await when you're doing this, it kind of makes sense. If you want to make sure something got written or not, you want to test on it. But you can still, if you don't do that, you should be aware that anything that you queue after an atomic write, even with the regular write operator, will become an atomic write. Because the if things cannot be sent, we basically, the application has to back up to the last known good point of what was sent. And those are the semantics. OK, we have question. Alan is queued. So I, my first question is, what are the what are the atomicity guarantees? Is it just around flow control? This this is mostly about flow control, yes. So, okay. Uh, so it, if I yeah. have this, is it stream flow control, connection flow control, or both? It would be both. Okay. As but, far so as I know, it seems like there would potentially be a possibility that even though, like, the data could be interleaved on the wire, I could send part of this data, then send data from another stream, and then send the rest of the data. Yeah, so there's there's no limitation on interleaving on this one. So uh, the other mechanisms for re preventing interleaving would be send groups and that kind of stuff. So this is or orthogonal to that, if you, if you will. So this is morely, more of a uh, web API contract that if this, uh, for some reason, only got partially sent, then uh, we want to hear about it. But yes, you're right. It can still be interleaved as far as I know. Although that, again, is the... Um, the difficulty here, both with this concept and with the previous slide on send groups, is that it's an API surface swimming in a sea of implementation.find behavior. So uh, it's more about getting the the concepts and the contracts right uh, so that the user agent knows what the application wants. OK, yeah, it seems, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's, I've not read all the documentation, but I'm sure this is something that needs to be carefully documented to what application developers are going to use it for and what problems might arise or what they, you know, for example, they may think, oh, it's going to all go in one packet. But if the atomic ride is bigger than one packet, then it's maybe not as atomic as they think it is, um, right? In terms of how the receiver processes it or like when it returns, does that mean the peer has acted or it just has gotten all sent? So there, there's just, which is fine to have any behavior just to make sure that it's documented. Um, Shoot, and I think there's another follow-up I had on the last thing that you had said, but I've sure. since forgotten it. So I'll go ahead and let Luke go. All right, thanks. Yeah, I'll just say, uh, I think for most of the time in these meetings, most users seem interested in these uh, media sending uh, use cases, but this would be a different use case where you want to implement something transactional and you had some application logic that relied on a, a server responding to stream, finishing stream A before it, finished, before it reads stream B and that kind of stuff. So, which could include, if you're not careful, people have run into um, live deadlocks, basically, with the client and server. So this is a tool in your toolbox to prevent that. OK, we have another question in queue. I can't see who it is. Uh, it's Luke. Yeah, so I, I was just going to second what Alan says. Um, there's, there's a, it is a tool, but it is also a foot gun, because uh, when you see a word like atomic, you assume that the right was flushed. It's all arrived on the other side, you know, <laughs> but networking is a lot harder than that. Um, you could be blocked yes. by co congestion control, you know, packet loss. Just because atomic write mm -hmm. finished doesn't mean that anything happened, actually. It doesn't guarantee any delivery. Um, so, yeah, that's my only, like, feedback. It's just maybe it's like yeah. bike shedding, the name, or maybe even the mechanism to know if you have flow control. It's a little better. Mm. Well, the PR hasn't merged yet, so there's still time to bike shed if, uh, if people want to come up with different names. And I, I think uh, earlier, as far as guaranteeing delivery, I think we stopped short of doing that even with stats and other things for, well, I think, trans, well, because, well, ultimately, right, the, the only 
the only part of the receiver is that can guarantee that something was received and processed if like as the application itself, right? So that is an out of band problem from our perspective. <coughs> okay, I think we're done with Q. Oh, Bernard, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say I, I always like the term atomic writer because it suggests that it's radioactive. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a solid definitely. Action. Thank you. <laughs> definitely not the method you should read for first depth. Do you have a question, Bernard, or just <laughs> witty? Just guide? a comment. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Next slide, then. Let's go. Okay. Just an update on uh, implementations. So. Chrome was first, and uh, Firefox uh, is hot on their heels. There's a good amount of green appearing down here, 73% globally. Trust that number. And Safari is coming along as well. So buy your developers' beers, and we will eventually have a solid green line down there. And Yanivar did want me to point out that Firefox for Android also supports web transport, but is showing red here. Next slide. So we have an issue we'd like some feedback from this group on. Uh, it concerns issue 559, quality of the bandwidth estimate. And you can read it faster than I can speak it, but I'll speak it anyway. Uh, we have an estimated send rate. Uh, it's the estimated rate at which data queued will be sent by the user agent in bits per second. And Victor was saying there might be some utility in exposing other attributes to give some indication of the quality of this bandwidth estimate. And some examples there, has there been a slow sample that's not application limited? Is it out of slow start? Is it the full bandwidth or the minimum of what's being observed? So we have some questions around there. The primary one being, is there utility in enhancing the information reported for send rate? And if so, which, which of these signals make sense? The ones here make sense, or are there more useful signals? And if we even if we agree that these signals are useful, are they expensive for the user agent to generate? Luke. So immediately raising my hand, because um, I, I, I implemented this at one point using the bandwidth estimate to do server-side ABR. Um, one thing that came up a lot is that Cubic and Reno have very different estimates than BBR in terms of like just even how smooth they are. Um, I think these are good points. But I kind of think it's almost getting to the lower level, like implementation details of these estimates that you kind of need to uh, account for. Uh, like if I were to get a bandwidth estimate for Cubic, I'm going to treat it completely different than the one from BBR. Um, and these are grid points. Application Limited also makes a huge, huge deal for um, uh, live video. Um, so I don't think there's a right answer there, but other than tighter knowledge of the underlying congestion control. I doubt we would go into listing the congestion control though. So how would you actually expose that in the API when you say Titan knowledge? I mean, I had a different algorithm based on if my estimate was from Cubic or BBR. I don't, I couldn't for my, my ABR decision-making. Um, BBR is a lot smoother, whereas Cubic would, would take 40% off of the estimated bit rate after a single packet loss, right? So the, even just the smoothing function that I had to use on the bandwidth estimate changed a lot based on the underlying implementation. Okay. That's nice. There's another person there. Wow, yeah, it's Bernard. Oh, it's Mo. Oh, never mind. Uh, Mo's and Addy. A uh, long time ago when we did this work back in RMCAT to, um, to, to try to signal to an application from a congestion controller what is the usable um, bandwidth or what are the usable congestion control parameters that the app would care about. An, an average send rate over a gross period of time was rarely sufficient for media uh, clients um, because that average send rate is usually for something like a long lived file transfer and not what an instantaneous, you know, burst of an iframe could be right now. Um, or, you know, what, what, uh, what can I send to the next round trip? So I think something that's more in line with what can I, what media frames can I actually transmit right now would be more useful than an overall bit rate of a long lived, you know, five seconds worth of video GOP, which is what this bits per second from BBR or, or 
or right. a TCP kind of congestion control is going to give you. But the transport knows nothing about media frames that you might be sending, so it's got to deliver. No, but, but the, the, the transport knows agnostic. transport knows what it's getting in a window, and it knows how fast it's adjusting its window and closing its window and opening its window, and those are the dynamics that an application would care about. Can I burst my iframe with 100 packets right now, or do I need to pace it over, you know, 10 frame times? That's the relevant thing that a web transport application would need to know. Can I send this iframe or not, or do I need to pace it? And how would that be expressed in terms of API enrichment here? The estimated send rate would not be a, a long-lived gross estimate of what you can do over the next 10 seconds. It would be what can I do in the next round trip or sub interval? What can I do in the next 33 millisecond frame yeah. time? That would be more relevant for a media application. Makes sense. Who's next in queue? Uh, that is Victor. Uh, I, the draft doesn't specify which congestion control you use, but I do not intend to ship this API until we have BBR. So it would be a BBR estimate. And BBR estimates believe uh, you do not, and BBR and in quick in general, you never burst out things you are pacing, and BBR is especially predictable from its pacing rate. So the bandwidth you would get from the API is a reasonable estimate of how much the congestion controller would let you to send, both within next 10 milliseconds and probably within next 500. Okay, Eric? Uh, Eric Kinnear, Apple. Um, couple of things as we've been taking notes. Uh, one of them is I, I quite like the idea of can we offer some sort of uh, interface that is more tuned towards what are you trying to do as in, you know, what Mo was saying of, of you know, can I send this much right now? Um, or maybe even let people configure, hey, this is my frame interval. Tell me what I can send in, in that amount of time. Um, rather than trying to do the, is this out of slow start? I think that gives us some more exposure of what's going on on the underlying connection than we maybe want to expose. And so we're already kind of struggling with the analysis of the things that we do expose. Adding a whole bunch of stuff like this seems like it it opens that door even further. Um, so I'd, I'd be hesitant to expose what we've listed on the slide here. I think if there's a better way to answer the question that people are actually trying to ask, then maybe that's also more useful because if you told a bunch of random people, hey, here's these very detailed, very specific, deeply meaningful numbers that you may not have spent the last however many years living in. Um, if they just want to know, hey, like, how big is this frame that I should be trying to send right now? Um, that might be a struggle to turn those numbers into a useful, meaningful value anyway. Um, the only other thing there is to what Victor just said, uh, I don't think we should assume that we're signing everybody up to do BBR for web transport as much as I think we all like BBR and want it to move forwards. Um, so let's try to not bake in those assumptions. Randall. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, in fact, I will echo what Eric said. The, um, uh, for right now, NECO, which is what Mo Mozilla uses, um, does not have a BBR implementation. We have Cubic and Reno. Reno. Um, so, you know, I don't expect that to change anytime in the near future. So we really do not want to bake in a specific congestion control thing. There's a, something in one of the congestion control working group on all the different um, uh, quick congestion control screens that are out there right now and uh, their level of conformance and, com and compatibility. So, and I think if there's some way to to redo this such that we are um, uh, providing a way for the application to um, feed information about what it wants to know, like what sort of time frame it cares about, what sort of you know, so so it can get back the information it actually needs, as opposed to trying to infer the information 
as Luke was mentioning, by trying to add smoothing and so forth, to try to try to figure out what what what's happening behind the scenes, it'd be uh, I think that'd be preferable. Uh, designing the API may be interesting, but thanks. And Victor is next, and I've cut the queue after Harold to keep us on track time wise. Uh, I actually have three things to say. Uh, one is uh, well. Uh... Thanks for keeping us on track time-wise, Victor. <laughs> yeah. Well, you may not make any assumptions about what congestion control you do, but that says if you try to use real-time media with uh, Cubic, uh, I think you will run into the limitations of that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is uh, I did originally propose, I don't remember where, in many, many issues it is, but the original API I proposed was you enter a time frame and some fraction from zero to one, which it, I called the confidence parameter, uh, and that would return you a number of how many bytes you could send. Uh, and I think people did not like it because they had no idea how whether that was useful or not, and that eventually got simplified to the bandwidth number. Uh, I, don't mind a more complex API, but that's just what happened. Uh, the third thing is uh, the all of the issues we just discussed are mostly orthogonal to the ones that is being asked on the slide. Uh, and the quality of the estimate on the slide is not about whether it's Cubic or Reno or what congestion control you use, because all congestion controls so fundamentally suffer from the same problem, which is you do not know how fast you can send until you've filled your channel to its full capacity. Uh, and the question of the signals and the signals that are being asked here are the, the signals that would indicate that that has happened. Yeah, I, I think the unfortunate reality is that congestion control algorithms are different. They, like what Victor said, they, they all predict the future differently and how well they predict the future matters, uh, how reliable you think their prediction is. Like a, an example is like a congestion control algorithm that works better with application limited uh, bandwidth is going to be better for live media and I can trust its estimate. Whereas if I, if it's, if I learn it's using something that doesn't work with application limited, uh, then I just can't trust it. I, I have to, I have to, you know, I have to half the the estimate because uh, I, I or whatever. Um, so I think the unfortunate reality is if you don't expose something like a congestion control algorithm, which which I don't think we should do, uh, I, there's just going to be user agent strings in there. I'm going to have to try and figure out what browser you're using, and then like hard code that Chrome's currently using BBR, so I can I can make better decisions about it. So. I don't think there's an easy way to do this. I don't think that we can expose all these stats. It's either too complicated or not good enough. Um, I don't estimating the future for bit rates is really hard, um, especially live media. Thanks, Luke. Who's next in queue? Oh, Bernard. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on what Mo said, which is you have to think about what this information is going to be used for. I mean, typically in the application, you have a couple of decisions to make. One of them would be what you set the encoder rate to, which is kind of the average rate. But keep in mind that that average is a, is, is, isn't necessarily what you're sending at a given moment, because that depends on whether you're sending P frames or, or keyframes. Um, but the other thing is there are algorithms that can respond to the immediate bandwidth available, like per frame QP. So that's a little bit of a different estimate. That's the number Mo is referring to. What can I send right now? Um, so they're, they're, different, they're different numbers, and the meaning does matter. Um, I do like the idea of knowing whether your application limited or not, because that might uh, cause the application to send probes to, to try to figure out what the real available bandwidth is. Um, so that's useful. Thanks, Bernard. Harold. Hi, Dal. All this jump? Is this all? Yes. Uh, so coincidentally, uh, 
just been working on the proposal in WebRTC land, WebRTC encode the transform to expose congestion control information. And uh, when analyzing this, I got out for the video case, there are really two numbers that are interesting. One is what should I configure my, my encoder for in terms of target bitrate? And can I send the frame that I currently have on hand without causing trouble? And the first uh, translates to estimated bandwidth, and the second translates actually to buffer depth. Am I going to overrun my outgoing buffers? So one thing is that I would encourage us to exchange information so that we get something that's roughly compatible with, between the two specs. And the other one is that I'd like to expose signals when we have a clear idea of what the application will use it for. And if we don't know what the application will use it for, as in the case of exposing the name of the, of, of the congestion control al algorithm, we shouldn't expose it. OK, thank you. That was good feedback on this. Let's get to our next and last slide from W3C. I know we're behind time here. The second issue we would like uh, some feedback on. So this is an issue about allowing the application to hint at the number of concurrent streams it would like. It was a use case that came up where someone wants to create 10,000 streams. And it was taking them several seconds to do it because the user agent would renegotiate max stream limit, but it only do it 100 at a time. So it had no idea that the application was trying to get to 10,000. And it took a while. So there's a proposal here uh, for an API. We get a, a, a medal for a really long uh, method name there. But uh, it is what it is inside the can. Um, so the idea is, should the application be able to hint uh, to the user agent on the max number of concurrent streams that it would like? So these are only hints. They don't have to do it. Um, and the questions are, should the, what should the user agent use for default values? And secondly, should we clamp these? Like is zero to 100,000 a reasonable range or is that crazy? And could we go with something imprecise in the low, medium, high bucket type approach? So any feedback on this question? Oh, hold on, I need to open the queue. Okay, Martin, go for it. Making it configurable sounds reasonable. Um, one question, um, is there a way to, uh, to see what the service limit is? Because if you are at the, um, on, on the client side trying to open that many streams. Um, there's no current point? API to see a service. There's no like max concurrent API unless you're proposing that one exists. I'm, I'm just asking. Okay, yeah. Would you like one to exist or? <laughs> Martin said maybe for the <laughs> minutes. Okay. Sorry, um, maybe to jump in here, just to try to answer. Uh, uh, so far what's on the slide is from the server to client direction. So it wouldn't impact uh, how many streams you could uh, create uh, client side. Although there's, so um, there's a slight difference between whether a stream was created by the server or uh, a client and versus and what its direction is. So there's some, you know, for bi-directional streams, for example, it gets a little thorny. Cool. And I think this is the end of your slides. That's uh, the end of slides. Yeah, that was inconclusive feedback, but nonetheless, we appreciate the time and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking we had a lively discussion on congestion control and tomorrow morning for a session, we have a congestion control working group meeting. I see one of the chairs is in the audience. Eric, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I think um, also to what Harold was saying about WebRTC um, and it would be good to make sure that like we're all exposing the same things in general. Uh, so happily we now have a venue where we could have a cool discussion like that about, you know, hey, we've got all these different congestion controls and what kind of thing would people need to know if we were exposing an API that would help both media and other use cases uh, know what they actually need.
Um, so that, that would probably be a good thing to, to bring up there, both on the mailing list and, and if anybody's interested, reach out and we can try to see if there's agenda time. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. And don't sit down just yet. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if anyone has thoughts on this, please email the CCWG list and uh, you can even offer to present to Mark, might find some time on his agenda, we'll see. Just take it off. The... All right. Are we sweet? All right, let's do some next slide. So we've made a couple of updates to H2. A uh, bunch of those have all landed. We've been closing things out. We're getting very, very low in our issue count, which is either a sign that we need more people to implement or that we're almost ready. In this case, I think we've got a, uh, at least one implementation in progress, but it would be nice to get more people to implement. Um, and hopefully through doing so, we discover that we are indeed almost ready. So. A uh, couple of issues to talk about today. Hopefully these are all pretty straightforward and don't take a ton of our time. Um, but the first one is 95, which is drain web transport session. So H2 only has the WT stop sending uh, capsule, which is not bidirectional. So I can say, hey, you stop sending things to me. But that doesn't mean that I can't keep sending things to you. Um, H3 has this capsule that we defined called drain web transport session, which says like, hey, why don't you stop sending me stuff? And I'm gonna stop sending you stuff. And I'm not willing to drop this on the floor right now because I'm trying to be respectful of the fact that we were just having a very nice conversation and I'd like to complete that conversation. But it'd be nice if you didn't bring up new topics because I'd like to go do something else now. Um, familiar from the hallway from the last 30 minutes. Um, so uh, one of the things that, that came up, and I, I think this uh, came up in some of the W3C discussions, was that we kind of want to have this compatible interface uh, with, with H3 so that we can offer similar constructs across H2 and H3. And I think one of our design principles here has uh, long since been um, being consistent across the two. So next slide, please. The proposal here is, this is the capsule. This is the current H3 text. Um, you can see there's a, a H3 there in the middle that we changed the three to a two. Um, but otherwise, uh, if this looks good to people, I think the proposal is basically uh, lift that into H2. Um, conveniently, we don't really actually have to define the capsule twice because these are capsules and we can refer to them for multiple places, which is uh, proving some doubts to be not as applicable as we thought they might have been. Um, so capsules are coming in handy in this case. Uh, do we want to just say drain web transport session is a thing for H2? It also works. Um, it plays well with go away. It plays well with um, stop sending. Uh, there are some distinctions in H2 versus H3 land about the way that go away and stop sending work. But the nice part about web transport is we've said it's going to look pretty much like the quick slash H3 does in the way that we handle the capsules. Um, and so this is another place where we can just be consistent and happy. Anybody have thoughts, opinions? I'm seeing a few head nods. Thumbs ups are nice too. Sweet, I see at least one tall, oh, multiple thumbs up. Super fun. Cool, so we'll lift that and, and pull that in. And I think this is, a, this is a big part of getting us to be actually consistent across um, both H2 and H3. Speaking of which, next slide, please. This is not necessarily the last time that we're gonna talk about this. It's certainly not the first time that we've talked about this. So next slide, please. This is a statement that I think we've all kind of agreed on, and we've certainly talked about when we wanted it to be um, consistent between H2 and H3. But I just wanted to, before we go, and um, I know that, that we've already started doing a lot of this, um, but especially as we talk about this from the W3C perspective, um, especially on my end, trying to ask people to implement this, one of the big questions that we get asked is like, okay, great, but we have WebSockets. And we say, well, no, no, not WebSockets. We don't think WebSockets are the thing. You should be using web transport because obviously you get all these nice new modern features of multi-streaming and, and all of that other stuff. Um, and the question is, okay, so like, are you going to come back next year and do web transport V2 that is this completely different thing? And are we going to need to do one of these every time we have a new quick or a new H4 or whatever else is going on? Um, and I think the claim that we've been trying to say is, is the one that's on the slide here, which is that web transport is transport agnostic. And we think that these concepts of unidirectional and bidirectional streams, it's, we don't yet, and we have not yet talked about a tri-directional stream. So we're probably in good shape for a while. Um, 
And so if we're going to do something that is truly transport agnostic, um, we think that there should be a transport concept, probably in the web transport overview document, um, that represents the things that a web transport um, underlying wire protocol needs to provide in order to be used under a web transport API. Um, and concretely, the statement that we're saying is that H2 and H3 aren't the end of it. Um, that someday you could add a, a third thing. Um, and I know there have been some discussions about that third thing, maybe being web transport over web sockets or H1 or all sorts of other fun stuff. So you could do SCTP. Um, as long as you can provide those same things that are in the web transport overview doc, then we think we're in good shape. Um, I think that's where we have been as a working group, but I wanted to make that a very explicit thing that we decided to commit to doing um, because I think it's gonna take a, a non-zero amount of hopefully mostly editorial work in the overview doc um, to make sure that that's in good shape. Um, so I don't see anybody hopping into the queue to be super upset about that, um, which I think sounds like we're all on the same page. Fantastic, I see multiple thumbs up, a very nice nod. Next slide, please. <coughs> to be clear, I'm not rating the quality of your nod, I just appreciate it. <laughs> All right, the uh, next issue is about flow control violations. We've got some text from the draft here, which you can tell because it's in a fun font. Um, and it says that the server must not close the connection if the client opens sessions that exceed a limit because they don't actually agree on how many sessions are currently open. Um, that's totally true for H3, uh, but in H2, um, I think Martin Thompson pointed out that well, we kind of do actually know, um, and it kind of is pretty consistent. And like, yes, asynchronous, sure, but we have a defined ordering for things. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. The proposal here will, will come at the end, but the, the background for the rest of this discussion is that part of the reason that we were trying to say, hey, be a little bit permissive here is the idea that somebody could promise you some flow control credit and then take it away. And we'd originally said, well, it's real easy if we just don't have to worry about that. So let's just say you can't take it away. Um, and we do that in some cases, we do that for web transport max streams. Um, I would encourage people to go look at the uh, issue associated with Max Streams and, and some of the uh, editorial, how do we refer to that? Um, in short, uh, human terms, um, you are saying that you are only ever allowed to have opened 10 streams in total, and that includes both closed and currently open streams. And so uh, a lot of people, I think, take that number 10, meaning that if I close one stream, I get to open a new one. And the answer is no. If you close one stream, they have to update it to 11 before you can open a new one. Um, and I'm guessing that those of you, whether or not you have read the draft, um, may be slightly surprised by that. So help us please find the sentence or two that would have made that the most clear. Um, perhaps that example is a useful thing to put in the document. Um, but if you have any great ideas on that, let's talk offline. Coming to our second bullet point here, um, in H2, you can just update your settings and max Streams is a capsule where we can cleverly define it so that it's impossible to go backwards. But for the settings value that comes in the web transport max sessions, um, you could very easily say, I, I allow you to have five sessions and then turn around and say, I allow you to have four sessions. Um, those are act, so everybody does in fact have a consistent view of what's going on on each side. Um, so if we go to the next slide, The proposal here is that if you lower the limit, if you say, hey, you could have had five sessions, and you say, great, thank you, I will open up five sessions. Isn't it nice that we're having five conversations at the same time? And then I turn around and I say, no, actually, I think you can only have four. Um, because we can agree on whether or not I know that you told me it was four, so I'm not unintentionally violating the spec um, and, and breaking your rule, um, we can allow the person on the other side to gracefully clean up that session and get rid of it as, it, as they go. Um, if I wanted to aggressively kill that session, I could always close the stream that that session is operating on. So I, as a, a um, recipient of that session as a server, can always protect myself and just tell you to go away. So this is only for cases where I'm trying to be nice to you. Um, if we write a single statement, which is that the server checks this limit only when a new session is opened, I think all of the other issues go away. Um, so if anybody believes that they don't, now would be the time to speak up. 
Um, so you have time. I say, hey, you can only do four now. And I say, oh, I'm so sad. I was really enjoying doing five, but I'll wrap up one of them. When I close that one, I can't then go open a new one. Um, but no one's penalizing me for continuing to use it. Um, if they need me to really, really stop, there are ways that they can say you actually must stop now, um, all the way up to removing it out from under me. Um, so uh, when I go to open a new session, I simply check what I think the current value of the setting is. If the setting says four and I say, oh, I already have four, then I say, great, you can't open a new session. Um, and that just propagates back up to the, hey, you, you hit the session limit, you're not allowed to go any further. Okay. I'm seeing a nod. Otherwise, apathy mixed with general acceptance. Sweet, all right, shrugging, thumbs up. And Alex is in the queue. Thank you for dispelling the apathy, Alex. Well, you don't know what he's going to say yet. <laughs> Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Alex Stronachowski, Google. Um, I have a question, which is, do we want to do something special for the sessions in draining state? Because it occurs to me that with the fix that you are proposing, one possible edge case that we can decide we don't care about is uh, my limit was five. We lowered it to four. I have started draining that session. Um, I would be below four. Mm -hmm. I obviously can't open anyone now because four is still the limit. We drain another session. That session is still open. I want to open a new session. The draining session still counts against me. And that could be sad for handover. So you're trying to remove the incentive to not gracefully drain things just to have room to keep going with new things, essentially. Um, well, I'm saying that I... I think that there is a perverse incentive that the draining sessions count against you here. Yep. And I don't have a good answer for whether or not they should or they should not. I will double check. Um, I have a dim memory of some text that indicated that they already didn't, um, but I don't remember if that was in a previous um, revision and we've already taken that out or if that is still there. Um, um, but, so. but even if that is there, then you have the converse problem of what semantic do you want there to be of if you have a fairly large limit that was lowered fairly severely. They're all now, all now in draining state, but you're still using them because that's also bad. Right, and we don't want people to then give up on the draining and yeah, have we, to we just don't want jettison them. Long live the draining lingers. Yep. Um, and there's also uh, by having a max sessions as a as a flat value, that means that I can cycle through them really really fast as well, which is an interesting. Uh, yeah, and that that's a variant of the recent frame shift attack, right? So, I think that. While I know the room is currently all nodding in agreement, I feel like this is actually an area we might want to think more about. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, um, I will. I will go double check uh, what the current, the, the latest version of the text says for for whether or not draining counts. Um, but we can we can do that in the issue as well. That was a very good call. Thank you. All right. Next slide. Victor. Victor's voice from the sky. All right. Thanks, Eric. Oh, it's me. OK. Oh, uh, <clears throat> we only have roughly uh, three issues, but all of them are very interesting. Uh, the first one is probably one of the less interesting is uh, so Web transport is meant to be mostly API compatible with Quick, and that means that you might want to take an application that runs over raw Quick and port it to web transport. And one of the problems we've encountered is that a Quick application sometimes expects that you should be able to do LPN negotiation. But there is nothing like that in web transport currently. So the proposal is to add it using the ALPN header that's already defined in RFC 7639. Uh, and that request, the original is this came out of MOQ working group where we were trying to use this for version negotiation. Uh, do people have opinions about this proposal? Okay, it sounds like no in, one objects. In the, oh, I see Mike 
bishop raising a non-virtual hand, that's all right. Come on over. And if folks have opinions such as thumbs up or thumb down, you can also show that to us. That's helpful, even if you don't feel like going up. Server unreachable. <laughs> Hello, server unreachable. I'm David. <laughs> um, I think this is fine as a mechanism. It feels a little weird to be sticking things in as ALPN tokens, which are not protocols you could speak over TLS directly. But, I mean, you can, we've already twisted it to say that ALPN defines a protocol stack. And so your protocol stack could be WebSocket over H whatever over, over TLS. Thanks. I'll write down an action item to clarify, at least in the document, whether there is a requirement there or not. But that's a good point. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah, I'll just, um, on the mock side, this would help the handshake quite a bit. Because um, right now we do, and we're also trying to support native quick at the same time. Um, so the native quick folks want to do AOPN. <laughs> and the web transfer folks are like, no, we need to do an extra round trip for version negotiation. Um, so it would be nice. It, it is nice to stick stuff in the connect request, is what I'm saying. And this is seems like it's well scoped that we could put this without arbitrary headers being a thing. Okay, uh, Magnus Bestlund. So is this formally ALPN? Are you expecting people to apply for them? Because I guess, I mean, even if the registry for ALPN is not an expert review, is, is people, in, is, is the IANA registry experts here going to balk at what you're proposing here? Uh, it references existing ALPM registry uh, since the idea is that some of those be protocols be defined over real quick I would expect them to register those uh, but Lucas Pardew, uh, the, we're kind of already abusing the ALPN registry, so this more abuse won't hit. Like maybe it's a time to <laughs> to like revisit whether we, we do something bigger, but that's a discussion of like within the ITF, not just this working group. So this is the most pragmatic option, I think, even if it's not the, the, the purest good one. If, if we were to say in the spec that like folks are encouraged to register them and leave it at that, would that be kind of all right? Because I think that's kind of conceptually similar to what Quick does itself. Uh, Jonathan, next time. So are we asking the W3C to provide an API for this? And what do we think web developers will do with that once we give that to them? Um, Luke, you want to take that one? I think you had an opinion from the mock side. I'm oh, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, he was asking if there was going to be an API here from the W3C, which I think the answer is yes. There's an issue mm -hmm. open in W3C. And then what would web developers do with that? And I think you had a use case. Yeah, we would definitely need it in W3C. So I can take that up. Eric Kinnear and Apple. Um, I do find the idea of just handing people that arbitrary string to encode whatever they want in um, as a web API mildly horrifying, but who knows? Maybe we'll find a way that's less less gross to do that. Uh, the other point there, I think, is is to what Mike was saying about you know, hey, we want this to work for any real ALPN. Um, in theory, the ALPNs that we're using with Quick are for some purpose is real. Um, and so yes, web transport has a shape that is more complicated than a single TLS stream, but hopefully 
web transport providing essentially what quick is providing for the web means that anything you could run over real quick you should be able to run over web transport and that's kind of the point lucas pardu the so i've seen interop issues with alpns um where they're believed to be strings and they're not the byte strings so you, they get casts and then things fall over because of false expectations in them. Um, it's a bit of a foot gun, for sure. Uh, should we, and, and sorry, and then to answer, so that's that point, uh, to answer David's point, we could encourage people to register stuff. So that uh, IANA registry is also not maybe geared up for provisional registrations versus permanent ones, etc. I'd have to remind myself, but um, we don't want to DOS the designated experts for that registry trying to use things that they maybe don't anticipate. I can't recall for all of the different quick, uh, sorry, HP3 versions that we had for all the drafts if we tried to register any of them apart from the final one. No, no. Mike, Mike Bishop says no, we didn't try to register any of them apart from the final one. That's fair, and I just pulled it up, the registry's expert review in case that's relevant. Victor? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the W3C, well, I originally felt that issue with W3C, and we, the discussion, I remember, was that people were okay with this existing. Uh, I think the alternative here, so it's either ALPN, or we just introduce a header that's called not ALPN, and make it like a pro sub protocol is like what WebSocket already does. Uh, it would work the same, it functionally absolutely the same. But the question is, are we implying that this is like a token that should be an IANA registry or not? Thanks, Victor. Mike, go ahead. Mike Bishop again, this time the server is reachable. Um, so we're already directing, if I'm not incorrect here, we're already directing the web transport session to a resource. Does the resource not provide sufficient granularity as to the thing you're trying to talk to it? Because it, naively, I would have thought if you need to speak multiple sub protocols, you would just put them in related resources. Oh, almost you can put, you can handle the request part, but you don't get a response. You would need to put it in a body, and now you have this problem where you have to figure out which of your data streams is the ones that has a response, etc. So that's the complication. So basically what we're saying is I can speak mock version two, three, and four, and I want to find out from the server which ones it speaks. Yeah. Okay. So the other flavor of this might just be a server declaration of what its supported web transport protocols are that you could discover as part of your H3 setup or HTTP connection. So speaking as chair, what I'm seeing is there are folks exciting on having this feature and they have a use case for it. I have folks who think, oh, this is kind of gross. Um, does anyone feel really strongly here? Um, like, are, are folks strongly objected to this? Because I think as far as the ITF layer of web transport goes, all this would be, would be, hey, use the LPN header from 7639 if you want that, and then it would be work in W3C. Um, so to, like, so I'm inclined, you know, based on what I'm hearing to say, unless someone strongly objects, maybe this goes in. So does anyone strongly object? Please speak up. Magnus, go ahead. <clears throat> so from an experience with the MIME types and RTP payload formats, I would maybe suggest that you actually divorce actually ALPN Use the same semantics, all these things, but call it your own thing here. Uh, and have, if you need a registry, define a new registry. But to me, it seems like this might potentially just be something you use between application and destination to say, okay, are we agreeing 
oh, that you both can, and then you will control both endpoints the saying it's just the fact of have a reef to entity that actually do this. So it might be worth to not saying you don't might not even need a registry for it, but call it something else, but make it like ELPN, but I think it's fine. I would just avoid overloading the actual ELPN registry. Okay, so the proposal for Magnus is to keep the concept, but disconnect it from ELPN and the existing registry. Uh, does, does that sound workable, folks? Eric? I don't usually stand up just to say plus one, but in thinking about how much I actually cared versus it was just madly annoying, um, given that it's not at all hard for us to have something that is just called a slightly different thing and doesn't stomp on that list, that gets us basically back to the sub protocol thing. Um, and it seems like that gives us all the things that we want and avoids the issue entirely. Awesome. Thank you. Bernard? Yeah, um, just referring to what Magnus just said, I, I think uh, if you do, when we'll just need to be real careful about the IANA considerations. Because just remember, IANA only does what we tell them to do. They can't read our minds. Um, oh. That, that makes sense. Yeah, we'll ask our editors to get it right. Uh, okay, does anyone object to this plan of doing something like LPN that, but that is not LPN? All right, we'll confirm this on the list as per usual, but thanks folks. Victor, you're muted. Oh, I have the third. Oh, I, I was trying to forget that this exists. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, let, let's talk about flow control and how do we do flow control in web transfer. So, so web transfer flow control problem is a bit different from uh, the quick flow control problem. So, in web transport, we already have the global flow control for the entire quick connection. And I'm going to talk about strict limits because they're easier to reason about, but this also applies to next data that's global. Uh, the problem is roughly that we already have a mechanism to limit total number of strings, uh, but, the, but we have multiple web transfer sessions that are independent and will attempt to open streams. And we will also have a HTTP request, which also need to exist in that connection for everything to work. Uh, so roughly the premise is uh, how do we let, how do we ensure that within the existing limits that we have for max streams, we are able to fairly split up up the streams. Uh, next slide. So the roughly mental model here is very simple. It's you have streams that are associated with web transfer sessions and streams that are not, that are HTTP requests. So if you have max concurrent streams for a given connection, it would be should be max requests plus max sessions times max streams per session. Uh, and you can kind of use that equa equation to figure out what you, uh, what some of this should be. And we already have max sessions in the protocol. Uh, we kind of have max concurrent streams, but not really since max streams is only the current indication, but the peer might be doing the thing where it ramps up exponentially or something depending on the limit. There are multiple schemes. So what we could do is we could send this explicitly. Next slide. So the proposal I have, uh, this is for stream limit, but it extends for others, is that the server uh, sends you a number that is, this is how many max concurrent streams I expect to let you grab get flow control credit. And here is, how many max streams per, per web transfer session you should allocate. And note that this is not a strict limit because for the strict limit for safety, we have the web transport global thing. Uh, but 
this is still useful for the client because as long as the client follows this limit, it can prevent the sessions from uh, uh, ex using up all of the strings. Uh, next slide. So here is a simple example. We use the max stream limit of 100, which is, I believe, some RFC 9114 actually suggests that number. Uh, and we say that here is a hint that you should allow at most 30 streams per session and you should allow at most three sessions. And what this means is you have 30 times three equals 90 web transfer data streams and you still have headroom for 10 HTTP requests. Uh, and as long as the browser would limit on its own side, uh, you will not run out of those. Uh, so that's a proposal. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, there are some alternatives that are probably all of them are in theory more complex. Uh, it's less to implement one of them is to do a quick style flow control and makes the server ensure that everything is allocated fairly uh, and then tell what the limits are to the peer. And the second one is uh, you just remove the global limit and then just for every session you set your own limits, but you need to change the protocol for that. Oh. So that is roughly the proposals. Now we already have people in the queue. Uh, Martin. I like the idea of hints. Um, I like the idea of sending hints. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that you can't update these hints um, over the lifetime of the session. Um, the way that quick flow control works, uh, and that also applies to streams, is that a server can say, like, I, I'm building trust with this client, and I'm now granting a higher, higher stream limit because I, I see that the, the client is using it for something useful. Um, that's not possible in settings because in H3, uh, settings can only be sent once. So we might want to consider putting it into a capsule, maybe, because then we can, we can send a new hint uh, during the connection. Uh, I think this is valid. So one thing I would note is that there are some flow control limits in Quix that are not updatable, like most notably the initial stream flow control window. And when we discuss that, we agreed that it's bad that it's not updatable. But if you do find it useful to update, we can always extend that. So uh, if there are people who are practically interested in this, this is a possible extension, but uh, not sure about how exactly useful it is at this point. Uh, Luke. Yeah, so these examples are with max streams, which honestly doesn't really matter. <laughs> you can just set a big limit. I'm a little worried about max data uh, and whatnot. Like when you start multiplying by the max number of sessions you could have, and the max data per stream and whatever these hints do, you, you get a big number of gigabytes. Um, I, I don't, something tells me that just blindly multiplying and setting a large limit like that and evenly dividing upon all streams is just not, I, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem like a useful hint. Um, I, I don't know. I, th I think that just need to rethink the max data case a, a little bit. And even assuming that all sessions have the same behavior, like you could have you could have max sessions ten. One of them could only use three streams, another one could use a thousand. Um, but by just saying this hint, it's kind of like setting an average. Um, something feels weird. Two thoughts. Um, one, doing something that's a hint is a little bit like we're going to do all the work for it, but then not actually do it. Um, so I'd be tempted to, unless we're really struggling with the enforcement, and I know we struggled a little bit with the enforcement, but I'm not sure quite how far we really want to abandon that effort is. Um, the other one is is very much what, what Luke was just saying. Um, when we start talking about data limits, one of the most important things that we do in our current implementations of H2 and H3 uh, that we're shipping is 
not allow gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes of memory to be used because um, that's often a good way to run out of gigabytes of memory. Um, so we end up doing things where you have a high limit on any individual stream and a low overall connection limit. And that's saying, hey, you know, I'm willing to let any stream go up to some amount, but overall the sum of all the streams still needs to stay low so that I don't just say, hey, I have 100 streams open and each one can do X amount and now I have that times 100. Um, so I, I think we still need to be able to do that. I don't think you can imply even multiplication like that. One of the other things worth noting is uh, our current strategy for some of this is to allow some of the streams higher limits than others. Um, and that kind of goes back to the comment around, you know, building trust. In this case, for us, it's it's a we aren't willing to allow 100 streams to each potentially take up a certain amount, but we don't want people who are trying to move large quantity of data on not that many streams to be screwed. Uh, so I don't think you can say that they're going to be even. We know of multiple places where today we have deployed software that is depending on them not being the same. Dragon Meow, it's Microsoft. Uh, I'm just wondering why we need this because it's just uh, the, the clients can decide on the number. It's like dividing them, <laughs> basically. It's a hint and they can just do division. Uh, th there is a problem with dividing the numbers. We don't know all of the number. It would, if there were no HTTP requests in the equations, that would have been easy uh, because, for instance, for server initiated by directional streams, you can just take your flow control window and divide it by max session since that's your limit. Uh, but here we uh, kind of don't have the, we have to account that there are other things that are not web transferred. Yeah, but there can be some heuristics that clients decide on how to divide it because it's it's just the heuristic. The server doesn't know much more than the client in this case, probably. Um. Uh, John from Linux. Um, I maybe this is raising too many rat holes, but um, it occurs to me that these same problems occur with the discussion we were having earlier about the congestion control windows, because those are also going to be affected by you know this connection sharing and invisible things that are H three that are happening behind your back. And so um, I worry that those are going to be similarly hard to be applied usefully um, by APIs. Thanks, Jonathan. So there's not an obvious slam dunk thing that everyone loves here, but given that this is one of the few remaining issues between us and the finish line, I think it would be good to figure something out. Um, so I'm getting a sense uh, that our two probably most direct path forwards are doing nothing and the hints that Victor proposes uh, does someone remember we we had a reason why doing nothing was a problem, right? Or Eric, go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, like all the reasons that you want flow control and all the reasons that we suffered through adding those to all the other protocols that we've shipped, like Quick and H2 and everything else. Um, mm. We we did have another proposal um, that we spent a good chunk of time in SF talking about mm. uh, that we wrote up, which was not just hints. So I'd be hesitant to go with hints, which seems like it has some pretty clear blockers um, as our only not do nothing option. Totally fair. Thank you. Luke? And just to elaborate on why, unfortunately, I think we need flow control is um, if I have a, a, a tab that's just deadlocked or something, and it's just not reading from quick streams, I don't want that to then steal all the bandwidth from every other tab. I think it's a foot gun using pooling if we don't have flow control um, that acts like it's two separate quick uh, sessions or connections. Um, so I don't think the hint quite nails that. Um, if anything, again, it would be a reason not to use pooling 
right? If you evenly divide your, your max data across every stream uh, session evenly, it's actually just better to dial multiple quick connections. Thanks, Luke. All right, I'm going to cut the queue after Alan. Alan, go ahead. No, I'll get the last word. Nice try. Yeah, we're going to we're going to use QCRAM and call it QPAC. Oh, whoops, sorry. Different answer that I'm being asked to give. Um, OK, uh, I is I think the main reason we don't want to do the like actual like define it all is that it's just a lot of work and nobody really wants to do it. And it if it's really only a problem for pooling, at least right now, I've only I've heard that most browsers are just not going to implement pooling. So if, at least anytime if that's maybe maybe a browser implementer can jump in and say if that's actually true. What are you doing it? OK. Um, in which case, maybe it's a, it's not great for interop, but we just define the complicated thing that gives us like all the knobs you need if you're going to do pooling. And then since the browsers aren't doing pooling right now, they, the like, I don't want to argument is fine. They don't have to actually do that, right? Is that, is that a way forward? I don't know. Um, what I'm getting here as chair is that we're going to need more discussion on this topic. Um, so, We'll circle back long chairs, maybe like a little interim meeting focused on this one topic with presentations for every single proposal might be a better path forward here. Because I think part of it is that a lot of us, myself included, don't have the entire state of everything in their brains. And so it's hard to reason about such things. So we might like spending more time on it would be useful, which won't be possible in the nine minutes we have left today. So let's um, put a pin in this one for now and move on to the next slide, Victor. Oh yeah, well, my favorite topic is uh, there are three issues here that are related and overlapping. Uh, and basically, uh, the problem is that we negotiate web transport support using settings, and we also negotiate the exact version of web transport you use using settings. Uh, and uh, there are two and some of those settings alter the way in which you parse your HTTP frames. So the general rule here, the one that I hope is less controversial is that the client must wait until it receives settings from the server before it initiates the uh, extended connect or sends any of the data streams. Uh, and there is the other one, which is the server that it should must not read any data on the client by directional streams until it receives the client settings because then that's the point at which it knows what version it's using. Uh, I already see people in the queue, so let's go. Yes, um, fully agree with the first point. Uh, client must wait until it has the settings frame. That's fine. That's reasonable. You can send it in 0.5 RTT data, so it doesn't cost you any any latency. Uh, I Actually, mean... just a quick point. If anyone disagrees with that point, because I think that one everyone agrees probably on, if anyone disagrees with the first point of the client must wait until the settings, please get in, get in the mic line now. But otherwise, I think that one will get agreement on. But now, otherwise, let's focus on the second one. Yeah, I'm 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 a bit unhappy about the the second point that the server must um, must sit on streams until it has received the the settings. So in the in the in the, in the case where we have a well-behaved client, it wouldn't have to buffer anything for long, but a malicious client can just withhold the settings for an arbitrary amount of time, and then I have to uh, buffer in an amount of streams that's limited by my um, quick quick stream limit, um, which is not nice it's also not the end of the world the reason i dislike it is not because of the memory i have to commit to this but because of the uh, additional logic i have to implement on my http server uh, implementation um, oh. my h3 implementations is is currently structured in a way that i i get i get a, i get a request i immediately handle it like i i process it or i reject it but i never have to buffer a request now, if we have to wait until we, we receive the settings, I have to change that logic in my implementation, which is not nice. 
and the thing that's even less nice is that I only have to do this because web transport version negotiation depends on this. And we only need web transport version negotiation for the draft versions. So I have to now restructure my HTTP server to, to support web transport drafts. And I can then remove this once the web transport RFC ships and I, I remove support for the draft versions. That doesn't seem like a reasonable thing. So the, the, the thing I said is it has a few caveats. Like at the moment, the client has to send the, um, has to send the web transport um, max, max session setting, uh, as well as the HTTP datagram setting. I think there are ways around this. I've opened si um, a separate issue issues uh, for that. I think it should be should be pretty trivial. So we 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 could be in a we could get ourselves in in, in a position where the server doesn't have to buffer anything. Thanks, Martin. I've cut the queue given there are five minutes less in the session, and the chairs want to take some a couple of those to wrap up so go for uh, it Alan. i'll keep it real. i'm just gonna i think plus one to everything that, that martin said speaking of things i don't want to do i don't want to do this especially not for web transport version negotiations luke uh I'll, I'll make it quick um does an h3 server have to wait for the settings frame before it can read any requests I'm getting a lot. Because I thought of it did, that. and then I don't know why this would be any different for web transport. I don't think that's a property of H3, and I'm seeing the editors of relevant documents shake their head vigorously. I'm faster, but Mike's Well, what makes you think we want the latter? <laughs> <laughs> Mike Bishop, not sure on that comparison, but we'll see. Um, so the design in H3 was that a setting should always be the most conservative, should default to the most conservative possible value. And a settings frame could only expand the scope of what you were willing to do. So the application here would be that the default value is, I don't support anything. And when you get the settings frame, then it will tell you, oh yeah, now there are some other things you can do. So, there, uh, so you can you don't have to wait until you see the settings frame to send a request at all. Um, but for example, you have to assume the QPAC table size is zero. So, so in this you... case, we're talking about the the other direction where it, the if you can't send a response. like can the ser does the server need to wait for the client setting before it can parse a request and send a response? No. Uh, it cannot, it has to assume the QPAC size is zero. All of the capabilities that are optional, it can't use until it knows whether the client supports them. Great. Thank you. All right. So to wrap up this issue for today, I think we're in agreement on the first bit, which is the client must wait until it has the server setting to send this request, because until then, it doesn't know that the server is not going to barf. Uh, but we're, we need to figure out a solution for the second one, because some folks strongly object to Victor's proposal. So we'll keep discussing this on the issue. All right. Uh, thanks, Victor, for the presentation, and everyone for the conversation. Uh, Bernard, one more slide. OK, so we're getting close to done and I don't want to jinx it um, but we're like the number of issues is getting quite small uh, as we saw we still have a few open ones but like not that many and so modulo those I think our editors will write some PRs for the ones where we've come to agreement and ideally we can resolve the ones where we haven't in the near future and then all of our favorite software engineers can go write some code about this. And then kind of in parallel, the software implementation can happen with the editors doing editorial work. We have a bunch of open issues that are purely editorial and that they won't impact the protocol, but will modify the structure of the documents, which we think are really important before publication, but aren't blocking in any way to implementation. And then once we have those, we can working group last call this and see where we get because the next bit is really getting a lot of implementation of these and a lot of deployment because that's how we're going to find if we have actual protocol bugs before we ship the spec so all in all we're in good shape 
please stay on top of your email and GitHub to continue these conversations and help us by writing some code. Thanks, everyone, and see you on the list. Yeah, and I guess we will uh, schedule an interim, David? Uh, yep. So okay. uh, let's you and I sync up on that. I think that's probably the best option, but let's, let, let's chat offline. Yes. So are are they uh, in the past at this point? <laughs> yes. By two years or so. One option is to remove the dates as well. Yeah, no, and I think we're all getting close. I think setting them, you know, sending it to the industry before the fall or before next summer. Right, yeah, no, it's just that they're in the future and not in the past. Yep, cool. No, no, yeah, I can take a look. I just forget about these. Hi. Hi. Oh, nice.